And it's now over to Elizabeth. I'll just move the screen across so it's just fully Elizabeth and nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How are you? Hi, Alison. Um, so thank you, Karen, for inviting me along to, to talk about a subject that I could talk about for hours. Um, I am an IPDM technician with GB Crop Protection, uh, which is an agricultural-based company here in the Goulburn Valley. My strength is uh, fruit, fruit production. So that's where I've spent the last 15 years doing IPDM there and moving into vegetables at the moment for the last couple of years and uh, really excited to see that the IPDM movement is gaining momentum in, in Broadacre. It has been, it has been a, uh, a field, I suppose, that hasn't really embraced the IPDM culture. So it's awesome to see all of you uh, are interested in, in learning about IPDM. So that's me. IPDM. IPDM. Oh, sorry. IPDM. Uh, you may know it as IPM. That is Integrated Pest and Disease Management. There are a lot of other letters you could put in there, soil, water, weeds, but IPDM is the, the current catchphrase for, for what we're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions just yet? Uh, oh, beef cattle. So we've got a few people that have responded already in relation to farming type. Yeah. We've got beef cattle uh, and general knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and and olives, olives as well, which is a yeah. they're an interesting that's an interesting growing system. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry, Rhiannon and and, um, and Robert. I don't know anything about animals. <laughs> I like working with trees because they don't bleed on you. <laughs> <That's> just, <laughs> And that's that's where we're going to leave that. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, where am I meant to be putting in the? There's a chat box. It's got a square. It looks like a talking box. Can you see that at the bottom of your screen, Phil? Yeah. Hey. Can you see on the screen? It's got a. There's a ribbon or a bar. It's got some symbols on them. Yeah, so it's Just, got the cam it's got the camera, the mute. Yep, keep going. Go four across. There's a box that looks like a talking box. Raise your hand. Next one over. Show conversation. Hide com that's it. Show the conversation. That's where you put in. So I love Tom, Tisu. <laughs> I'm not too keen. Just so just click on that and put it in. That's right. You'll see a box, uh, a uh, strip will come up to your right hand side, and other people have put in their uh, farming types in there. So you just put yours in there as well. Okay. Type down the bottom, there's a typing box. So, Jill, you came after we asked, but if you could put in what farming type you're interested in learning more about with IPM today. All right. I'll start um, sharing the presentation today. Okay. Very good. Okay, Perfect. excellent. So can we click across the slides with that? Yes, beautiful. So um, IPDM in practice. <laughs> There's one thing all, you know, most um, IPDM technicians do agree on and um, there's some that we don't, but the integrated pest and disease management principle has a three-tiered uh, three tiered practice. So the first thing that we really concentrate on in IPDM is our, our biological footprint. So that includes um, understanding the life cycle of the pest that we are needing to target, um, developing diversity for generalist predators and also for uh, um, for specialist predators. Now, some of my jargon may be a little bit restricted to horticulture. So please, if you have any questions or you're not understanding what I'm saying, let me know. The other thing is I, I am deaf <laughs> and I might swallow my words sometimes. So please don't think I'm stupid. Just can't talk properly. Um, so the back to the understanding the life cycle of the pest, 
developing the diversity within our area or area-wide management. You're, I'm sure you're familiar with that term, so I will say area-wide management. And also using or introducing naturally occurring predators for target pests. And sometimes it can be as simple as, um, you know, developing us. No, we're going over to cultural for that. Then the next, that's our most important one with IPDM, is letting our free natural predators work for us before throwing money at it or anything like that. The next thing that we really, and this is the, this I, I want to say easiest part, but it's not always easy. But to me, this seems one of the most simple and uh, economic practices in, in IPDM. And that's our cultural practices. That's our habit of what we're doing. Now, with big no till and this this tilling, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The minimising compaction yeah. and, and tilling and everything like that. That's a beautiful IPDM practice that's really simple to do. And your benefits to your soil health are, are great. Our cultural practices in horticulture could be as simple as changing the way we we spray or we do uh, pruning management. If we've always gone from east to west, for example, and our pest predator, uh, I mean our pest pressure is moving from east to west or our fungal and disease issues are moving from east to west, then we just simply flip it and start going from west to east. How easy is that? It seems easy. So the same same with apply with cropping. Yeah. Or yes. raising. Yeah, there's no difference from horticulture. Exactly. Exactly. So I don't want to, I, if I'm not saying the right words, Karen's going to pull me up. This is awesome. Um, something that you are also probably familiar with is the rotational cropping. And I'm not even going to pretend I know anything <laughs> about pro, uh, cropping a broad acre in that sense. But when I'm working with my vegetable growers, then we really look at using rotational cropping. And even in uh, tree production, occasionally throwing in a, a crop of faba beans to help with the soil uh, nitrogen fixation and to increase that mycelium to help with the disease reduction. So um, these are very, very simple and will seem simple and, and quite logical ways of, of farming. It's a bit, you know, IPDM could also be just called smart farming. Um, IPDM was, you know, was the old style of farming before all this, you know, high production, high production came into place. And hygiene. Um, hygiene is just across across the board everywhere. Using using your practices to reduce the weed bank. So you're using less uh, chemistry on that. And then as a last resort, um, and I'm not going to say don't spray, don't spray, because in my IPDM um, experience and what I do, it's really uh, when it comes to chemistry, and that's our third tier. It's um, been really selective with the chemistries that we have to use. When I'm out in the field, it's not what can I kill; it's what is here to save and what is going to cause uh, give me benefit later, and what's going to cause me damage, and what predator is here that is going to minimise that you know, that pest later. Uh, so selective chemicals are great and timing of intervention. If, if you come in early and you break the life cycle, like with red-legged earth mite, you can break that life cycle and then it's all over and done with. But with your timing of intervention, if you come in too late and you're, you've got adults that are reproducing, reproducing, you could th you, you'll be throwing everything at it for the rest of the season. But if you can time it, come in early and hard and that's it, then... Fingers crossed and all things going well. You get through your season and you get a beautiful crop off at the end. And with IPDM, and this may differ greatly with broadacre to, to horticulture, but the management rather than an eradication, so we don't truly want to eradicate everything that's out there. We want to manage and reduce those numbers so that the natural population of predators are able to maintain it because predators won't be there if they don't have a food source. That's that's it. <laughs> predators aren't there if there's nothing for them to feed. Otherwise, you're needing to feed the predators. And there are products out there that will feed the predators. But if you've got a, if you've got a food source there, let them have it. 
I keep saying there's such a difference between broadacre and horticulture. And just so you know, the broadacre and horticulture agronomists, we are in awe of the other <laughs> because it's such a different different growing system. And it's um, I think that broadacre agronomists have such a complex and risky style of, of agronomy. And then broadacre agronomists think that what you know, horticulture agronomists do is risky and complex. So it's, um, but there are some cons constants that we, we definitely agree to. Um, your soil health is, is one of the, one of the drivers. If you've got great soil health, and we're going back to the Vic Notel, but if you've got fantastic soil health, then you're in a head start already to, to, uh, let the IPDM work for you. Let the the beautiful you know ecosystem and uh, happen. It's hard if you're pushing stuff if you're pushing stuff uphill. <laughs> um, it's you know you may need to renovate your soil. You may need to to rejuvenate it, getting all working and again get those beautiful microbes and and loveliness happening because the soil becomes fatigued. We are, we we know that you know that. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know that. Um, the soil becomes fatigued and it just needs some love and it needs the microbes and all the good organisms put back into it. And it makes such a difference for the next couple of years. So when that becomes part of the, the, the practice, and that's your cultural practice, when that becomes part of the practice, then everything's great. Um, water and clean water and quality water and beautiful water is the same across horticulture and broadacre. Um, Irrigation systems is is a is a beautiful thing. I love, I love having irrigation, and I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have to have um, dry land cropping and the the struggles and the restrictions that that you suffer. But you know, access to water delivery systems is one of the one of the constants for us. Another one is the weather driven cycles. Um, for example, last season. In, in horticulture and apple and pear and stone fruit production, it wasn't a significant year for pests and diseases, but that weather that we had just was against us from the get-go. At the end of the season, it became beautiful and it, it became mild and lovely, but that volatile uh, weather at the start of the season and the, that crazy hot in the middle really um, put our trees and our systems under a great deal of pressure. A great deal of pressure and you know I assume it's I'm going to assume that it's um very similar for you guys now are you yeah? oh they're still back yeah. yeah so IPDM in Broadacre um where where why where what and how um so I in I, IPDM pretty much um comes from for a start, um, it's been around for over 30 years. Karen was an implementer for IPDM some time ago, ago, 15 years ago. Um, some of my mentors who have been with the instigators for IPDM within Australia, they started over 30 years ago. Um, so it's it's been around. It's not a new concept. It's just taken quite some time. And it starts in it starts in um, protective cropping more often than not because that's sort of a vacuum. It's it's easy to do. That's floriculture and and greenhouse um, greenhouse uh, production systems. And then from there we'll spread to outside and normally in veg vegetables first. And then uh, tree horticulture we've picked it up and we've run with it and we're loving it. And it's really exciting and great things are happening. And now it's really exciting to see that broadacre and cropping is is starting to get the benefits of the of the what horticulture and the protective um, floriculture and such have learned. And now it's able to be implemented in broadacre. So the, there's a few drivers um, and there's a few reasons why it, it's it's not as pronounced as it is in the other the other systems. Um, and it's exact same problems that horticulture faced. There's a very limited set of skilled IPDM technicians. It's a special kind of nerd that likes to be out there and watch bugs have sex. Um, pure and simple, that's, I love it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to apologise because I love it. It's, it's, I could talk about this all day long. But anyway, so it's taken, so there's uh, limited 
limited skilled IPDM technicians. The thing is, we're not selling chemistry, okay? We're selling the IPDM principle. You have to believe in that. There's no, there's no money in it. <laughs> um, and then, and they often get jaded in, you know, agronomy school to, you know, hit the KPIs. But anyway, um, so it's taken also, um, so it is a relatively new concept in, in broad acre and cropping. There's been a few stops and starts, but it's it's starting to gain momentum again, which is great. Um, the risks are huge. The risks are very big, and I understand that, and I can understand the, that that's a massive stumbling block. In my industry, there's been some really progressive people that have been willing to take that risk, and believe me, they've they've lost money, a lot of money uh, doing it, but they've taken that risk, and they go, this works, that works, this doesn't work. Um but they do take that risks. And so even if you are looking to implement IPDM, and it would be awesome, um, start small and work your way up. It, it happens. It, it can happen. There's there's things that we, we can know now with research and looking and, and talking that we can um, go, well, this will work, that will work, and that's never going to work. But anyway, um, so once industry and chemistry and producers which are which are the the growers are aligned then it becomes a a, a a beautiful triangle because a lot of the research happens from the industry and from the chemical producers well that's not really happening in broad acre because we're talking about millions and millions of liters of of chemistry going out every year every year multiple times a year so industry and chemistry companies haven't really wanted that to, to happen, but it is the way of the future and it is going to happen. So they are starting to become a bit more aware that producers are now driving this and they're demanding this and they're wanting this, which is great. Um, I've spoken about the risks. Let's not talk about risks. No risks. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of risks. No risks. <laughs> um, and also habits are really hard to break. You know, calendar spraying in, in horticulture is, is still happening um, but farmers are becoming aware that it's it's not working because the next driver that we have is the resistance to chemistry. I'm sure you guys are familiar with some aphids that, you know, aren't behaving anymore and also the chemistry for some of your red-legged red earth mite is not behaving the way it should be. Um, and so we're needing to think outside the block be box because it's not – wait five years for the problem to be solved, it's how do we solve it now? Because that's what we want to know. I've got a problem here today. How do I solve it? Yep. How do you solve it? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about horticulture. I might be able to help you there. But food safety is another big thing. Australia really has beautiful, beautiful food. And the rest of the world knows that. And it's something we really, we're really proud of. So our food safety and our human health and also the awareness of our environment are big drivers for, for our IPDM systems. We're talking about the benefits of IPDM, which is sustainable farming, environmental impact is less, uh, lessened. Sorry, I've got quality of fruit is enhanced. Um, because this came from a, a an IPDM. We've got a lot of growers there. Yeah, so we do have we do have other growers. Right. Yeah, um, time, water, and fuel saving is a really big a really big thing. Uh, human health benefits, of course, and there is an increased demand across the board for um, accredited IPDM food health safety. We call it um, Smart Fresh. In in horticulture, I'm not sure. No. I'm not sure what the what it would be called. Maybe in organic it. farming. Organic farming. Well, organic farming is a um, it's a it's a fantastic and there's it's just growing too. <laughs> it's growing and then there's also the significant cost saving on chemistry. Um, it's it is significant. I'm not going to pretend it's not, but. The risks are there. So with um, IPDM in practice to, to implement it, you need to find somebody um, who is experienced and who you trust and, and who is there in it. Sometimes it's taking a risk on somebody and letting them learn alongside you as well. So finding experienced advisors is, is one of the one of the big um, drawbacks with IPDM. And you know whether we want to admit it or not, 
there are there, mm, <laughs> there, there, there will be damage levels um, in IPDM. So often one of the things we need to be aware of is it's it often, I'm not going to say it always, but it sometimes gets worse before it gets better, uh, which is the sh which is a shame because you know after the third and it can take up to five years for it to get better in a horticulture environment. So after that first season or that second season, Sometimes it, it falls back because the, the farmer will fall back to their habits and spray this chemistry and then it's, you know, it's almost two steps to all, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, and you never quite get on top because IPDM is open to interpretation. It is in there's, – there's not one strict set of guidelines there. That's why I was saying the only thing we kind of all agree on is – the soil, the water, and the three cultural, the three cultural, uh, the sorry, the three tiered uh, process. Um, in my train of thought, I've had a different conversation over here, and it was awesome. <laughs> but I forgot what it was about. Um, so yeah, it, it will often get a little bit worse before it gets better. But if you can just hold on and you know just ride it through. The benefits of of staying the course um, after after some time, you know, it's just it's it's great and it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a really beautiful thing to see from a technician's point of view when everything is alive and, and wonderful out there. Um, so second, and the damage levels with IPDM. This this brings us to another point, which is that secondary pests may increase for some time until everything comes into a very very fine balance. An example for, uh, uh, that I'd like to give you, so um, the new or introduced species, especially with our biosecurity being the way it is, can really disrupt the IPDM systems. A really good example of this is um, Queensland fruit fly. I'll say it again, Queensland fruit fly. Nah. Anyway, so uh, we were doing some beautiful leaps and bounds with IPDM in, in horticulture, and then along came this pest that hadn't had a predator naturally evolve in alongside it in this area and also very limited uh, methods of control. So, and that threw our IPDM systems into, into a, a real spin and into haywire. So the IPDM technicians on the ground really had to think quick and play catch up with this pest. Good thing is it's only taken five years for us to play catch up with this pest and start to, to uh, understand it, control it, minimise the impact. I'm never going to say it's going to go away, but to minimise the impact, and which is very important. Um, and so it's having that new or introduced best, uh, sorry, pest come along, and um, such as the Russian green aphid, that's our, mm -hmm. our newest one for you guys, and the uh, fall army worm. Yeah, not too keen on that one either. <laughs> so, you know, these new pests and quickly quickly understanding how they behave and and how we can minimize that and going back to the weather the weather is the most strongest driver in in everything so climate and seasonal differences one year well for example again going back to queensland fruit fly last year uh, the weather was not in its favor it was hot it was dry it was hot it was dry it did not like it and that so it was minimised and the, the impact was lessened until the very end of the season where it's been wet, moist, warm, wet, moist, warm. And so that can indicate that next year we'll have a fruit fly uh, prevalent year. So similar to, to you guys, we started very, very cold uh, quickly and the red-legged earth mite, you know, worked its way up quite quickly and it has been around for quite some time. Are we good? Yep. Next I'm new at this. This is the first time I've done this, so please be kind. <laughs> uh, okay, now here we go. My favourite thing to talk about, insects having sex. <laughs> no, it is good. It is good. So um, the, um, any questions before we go further into insects? How do I check for questions? No, we won't go there. No, okay. <laughs> okay, they can talk if to you. If you've got a question, you yeah. take your mute off. Otherwise, it's a bit complicated when we've got one computer this end. 
Yep. Okay, so hoverflies. Now, hoverflies are a fantastic um, generalist predator. So it's a really good one for us to focus on. Um, they're naturally occurring all across Australia, all across the world, and they're quite are quite robust and very rugged and they have multiple benefits to us in um, in a cropping situation and also in, in a horticulture situation. But we'll, we'll focus on their benefits for you in the cropping situation. So the hoverfly, it likes to mimic a wasp, so a bird predator to that hoverfly or a dragonfly even would see that that little hoverfly fellow as a another predator and move away. So it has the black band, the yellow band, the black band, it has a very thin um, wasp-like body. But it's a bit more akin to a bee. So is in the in the fly family, the typical fly family, which is the diptera. Um, so but what it does is it pollinates in its adult stage. So when you have canola, beans, lupins, uh, vetch, beautiful things out there in the, that, that are flowering your uh, dicot, your dicot cropping, um, it, they're going to they're gonna pollinate for you. So we aren't always just reliant on bees. It's really important that we focus on, on how wonderful these uh, secondary pollinators are. So, and they're going to move around and move around. They'll move to the bushland and back into the back into the crop and the bushland and back into the crop, which is fantastic. Um, as adults, like I said, they're, they're pollinators. They love to feed on nectar and that's their only food source and water. That's their only food source as an adult. So we need to think about what we're doing with its life cycle and, and encouraging those uh, those habitats for it as an, as an adult. But as a larvae, and this is where the fun stuff happens as well, this is carnage out there. So as a larvae, which you'll see at the very bottom, uh, say uh, six o'clock on the screen, that guy gets around and he will eat anything anything he can get his hands on. Um, they particularly love aphids, which is fantastic for canola and uh, vetch growers. They really love the aphids, and they will eat up to a thousand in its in its life stage. This is the juvenile life stage, which is over eight days. So they're really rapid. Uh, rapid life cycle really quick you can go through quite a few life cycles in in one season I'm not going to do the maths um, <laughs> but the female she'll lay up to 800 eggs at a time which is which is a good number they might eat each other but that's okay that's the carnage that's the that's donate some to the cause um, so once the and the, the eggs are beautiful but once the egg is laid uh, with the optimum temperatures being 15 to, 15 to excuse me, I lost that piece of paper. Uh, the optimum temperatures are 15 to 28 degrees. Um, I think, don't quote me on that, it's on a piece of paper around here somewhere. But um, so two days from egg lay to hatch, eight days as a larvae, and then pupae as, uh, I'm not sure how long the pupae stage is, probably not long, but then pupae and then back into being adult stages again and then the whole thing goes around and around. Now, while the temperatures are from 10 degrees to 30 degrees, this is happening. So they're really, really prevalent for us and we get the most benefit for them in spring and autumn. Um, now, they, as I was saying, they love aphids, but they will take on anything the same size as them or smaller. So your smaller, your smaller um, instars of of caterpillars if they get them at the right time they'll eat eggs they're, they're awesome and so they're protein eaters at that stage and that's the only thing they can feed on and then they go back to being nectar pollen sugar eaters so yeah now i've spoken to a few people about ladybirds in in um vetch and cropping and stuff like that we we're talking about protein counts being tipped so that's why i wanted to focus on the hoverfly the really awesome thing is that you go through the life cycles, you go through the life cycles, but when you cut, the most of it is an adult and it's moved away. So when you cut with all those ladybugs in there, they go into your um, into your protein count, which is not great. And I'm not going to say I know a lot about it, but there's a little bit of information there. Um, so the hoverfly will be transient. It will come, it will go, it will come and go. Now there's a few wasps as well, mm. naturally occurring wasps and wasps that we can buy. 
which is great. <laughs> it is great. So we use a wasp called Trucker Grammar for our codly moss, our oriental fruit moss, Helicoverpa, which is Heliothus, and uh, light brown apple moss control, codly moss being our most major pest. Um, we have rates and thresholds for, for what to do and, and how to do it. But this has been, um, this is, like I said, about the, the big farmers taking the risks, taking the risks to, to try it and see what happens and let the research occur. There's no rate as such that I am aware of, but there are a few links that you will see in the at the end of this presentation and some great stuff that Karen has to send out that will um that will give you you know a bit more of a head dive down the rabbit hole a few few really strong IPDM experts doctors professors out there that can you know provide a bit more information and a, um much much further information than what I can hear right now. Next screen. Oh, <laughs> oh, heaven. Oh. <laughs> ba -bum! That was a segue, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so there's the links and the further reading for you. Um, Dr. Paul Horn and Jessica Page are just amazing, amazing people. Dr. Paul Horn was one of one of the first drivers of IPDM in horticulture systems and He's a, he's a fantastic entomologist and I've got a wee little bit of a crush on him <laughs> and all other entomologists. Um, I realise it's been recorded. <laughs> oh, it's not a secret. <laughs> um, now, the really good systems and really good information and, and some beautiful um, some beautiful resources and also tables for thresholds and and such is coming out of the grains and research grains research and development corporation um they're really putting some time effort and, and great people on the on the job for that the particular man there is um dr jim fortune um he's with the grdc and 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 some of the stuff that I've read that comes from him is just really practical and really wonderful and, and easy to read and, and, and a great start. Um, IPDM is a beautiful field that's coming for you guys and, you know, be on board is going to be fantastic. And bugs for bugs. Bugs oh, and bugs. Bugs for bugs. Bugs for bugs. So Dan Papchek and Wes at Bugs for Bugs. For bugs. Um, they've got a a great uh, a great range of beneficial insects to to buy, and this is where the Trucker Grammar wasp comes from. On the flyer that was sent for for this um, this workshop, there's a a beautiful picture of the Trucker Grammar. That is um, para parasitizing the Helicoverpa eggs. Helicoverpa is also Heliothus or army grub. It's got lots of names. And um, yes, yeah, so if you want a bit more information about um, how how to um, how many to put out and and what's what's the rate for these types of things, then then uh, Wes and uh, Wes and Dan there would uh, really be able to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's always questions about fruit fly. <laughs> I love questions about fruit fly. <laughs> so um, bugs for bugs actually provide beneficial insects to predate on pressed insects. And so you can actually order them in the mail and they'll send them to you. Uh, they, I know I've done it with ladybirds and with lacewings as well. And they're happy to send them to you. It's, it's their business and they're bigger than, well, I worked with them 15 years ago. And they are very big now compared yeah. to what they were like when I started working yeah. with them 15 years ago. It's yeah. a really big industry. It's a really big industry and it's developing. Mm -hmm. And the thing to be aware of when you are using um, when you are using biologicals, um, and biologicals is, you know, that's a really broad subject too when it comes to biologicals because a biological could be something as simple as a soil additive. Um, but and it's also could be a living organism, so it's all about nurturing that biological that you're putting in. So 
it's timing it for the right stage. It's making sure it has food to eat as well. There's no point releasing um, beneficial insects and and paying the money for it and the you know the because there is a risk. <laughs> Just so you know, but we do. We you know you absorb that. It's okay. Um, but you know timing, factoring in, you know, uh, risk benefit analysis, all that type of stuff. There's no point putting out a beautiful beneficial insect if it has nothing to, to feed on. Um, the other one is also choosing the right beneficial insect for your situation and your right time. And also I prefer to get ones uh, that will naturalise to the area that I'm working in um, because that way it becomes a forever commodity instead of a commodity that you're needing to top up top up all the time this way you can inoculate and increase your population and and you own them then so that's fantastic when you say naturalize you mean people insects once the crop is gone that we're helping protect will then just disperse into the natural environment and then yeah. come back to the crop yes yeah. yes okay. so um the diversity is and we you've got a a uh a spreadsheet to put up. Yes, you? yeah. I haven't got it with me, but yeah. yes. And so it's it's the um, border planting and and in, increasing your um, native shrub or or even planting shrubs that are and plants and such that are attractive to. For, we'll go back to the hoverfly, for example, the adult stage of the hoverfly when it's needing to do when it's needing to feed on nectar and sugar instead of having this monoculture of um, of one particular flower they like a bit of diversity too they don't want to eat the same thing but they'll go out you go. <laughs> yeah. um, they'll go out of your perimeter because they, they don't understand that you know this is this is my line and you can't cross it they'll go out of the perimeter they'll come back into the perimeter they'll go out of the perimeter so the transient the transient um the transient predators are so much uh more diversified and and a little bit more robust robust because you know when when and believe me it happens when you do have to come on with it even with a fungicide um fun fungicides have an impact a really significant impact on our beneficial flying insects our wasps and our, our beautiful um lace wings and stuff so when you do have to come on with a with a fungicide i think this year is going to be a pretty fungicide in a year um if you've got that that perimeter planting that insectary Mm-hmm. We called it a, you called it a pod. A pod or a strip. It's a just a, a strip of plants or a, an area of where the insects, beneficial insects can go to and just rest, yeah. feed, breed, whatever it might be. And so you, you plant plants according to the insects you want to attract. And there's a broad array of plant species that attract hoverflies, for instance, and they are those Plants that have got small white flowers on them, a bit like um, tea tree. Bursera is a fantastic plant to plant anywhere within a pollinator strip or around the property. It has a lot of beneficial insects, uh, wasps, everything you can think of. Now, I've got a question from Upper Goulburn Land Care Network. So Kim wants to know about Queensland fruit fly. Uh, Kim, is that you? You can take yourself off mute and ask the question. Hi, it's Kat. Um, oh, Kat. Oh, there you go. Sorry, Kat. No, you're right. Uh, I just wanted to know more about uh, what what pests you're using to control Queensland fruit fly. Uh, what? Sorry, what beneficial insects you're using? Uh, um, sadly, and, and very very sadly, like I said, there's no predators in uh, the northeast of Victoria or below. Um, upper New South Wales that is naturally occurring here. As a, nothing here has evolved alongside it, so we're, we're struggling um, quite a deal. So in Queensland, they haven't needed to develop um, a predator because there's lots of naturally occurring lizards, wasps, other flies, bees, um, and frogs, et cetera, et cetera, that have evolved alongside that fruit fly and see it as food. But here we we don't have anything commercial just yet. There's a, there's a quite a few worldwide um, worldwide organisations that are looking at using uh, 
parasitic nematodes to drench the soil when they're in their pupae stage. They're, you know, they're looking at wasps, they're looking at many, many things, but there's there's nothing. I wish, I so wish <laughs> that we had something. But what we implement in regards to IPDM with um with Queensland fruit fly control is the cultural practices that we have available and also hygiene. I mean, sorry, um, yeah, cultural practices, which is hygiene, massive. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to chemistry, so that the chemistry doesn't muck up our IPDM systems, it's about targeting chemistry and minimising the impact of the chemistry. Because if you go out and spray for Queensland fruit fly, you get secondary pest flares, which is not what we want. So but in saying that, you say that birds, bats, I'm assuming, frogs, lizards, all that sort of, if we encourage that around to our, if we've got a backyard system mm. that have got fruit fly or are trying to keep away fruit fly, we can attract all these insect, these natural occurring native animals yep. to, to the backyard and they will actually control the fruit fly a little bit. They will learn that they are food. Yeah. And then they will teach their young that they are food and then fruit fly becomes food. Yeah. So yeah. that's the great thing. Chickens are the chickens are the best thing you can do for fruit fly at the moment. So cats also I've got another question. I'm assuming you don't introduce anything until you actually have a pest. That is 100% true. That is 100% true. You, um, <clears throat> it's about monitoring and um, observing and calculating the thresholds. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, as I, I as I said before, I think. Uh, wasn't that, that long ago yet? We must have been when your question came up. Sorry. Um, that there's, there, there is no point putting it out there until they've got a food source mm. and the ability to go through their life cycle because normally we will get our um, beneficial insects either at egg stage or at adult stage. Uh, they're the easiest for for um, the companies that we that we buy them from to transport. So when we get them at adult stage, they will lay their eggs in the environment or where we're releasing them. And so you'll need food there for their larvae to to feed on really, really, really quickly. Um, or you know, if you're buying eggs, then there has to be food for them when they come out, or else they're just they're not even going to make it through their next their next life cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's about you, you target, you buy them at that stage so you can increase the numbers, increase the numbers, so that they're going to go through their life cycle alongside the pest. There's also that um, insects do a lot of pollinating too. So they may not be actually just coming and eating or getting rid of a pest. They also do a lot of pollinating as mm -hmm. well. So they do have other benefits, not just um, your pollinators. <laughs> I mean, insects. Um, eating your pest insects. Uh, for, uh, I'll give you an example on how important um, to us, to horticulture, hoverflies are. Um, the 2018-2019 fruit growing season, so 2018-19 um, October, was wet. Mm -hmm. All and that's when our that's when our uh, our flowers are, or our blossoms are, are occurring, and that's when we need the bees to do the pollinating. Mm -hmm. It rained and rained and rained and rained and did not stop raining. And bees aren't very active in the rain. No, they don't like it wet. They don't like it wet at all. They don't like wet feet. Um, and if it had not have been for the hoverflies, yeah. we would not have had a crop. Yeah. yeah, so hoverflies will work in the rain. They'll move around in the rain. They, you know, they're really, really active. I'm assuming ladybirds are in that system. That sort of they do pollinating as well, would they? Because they move from tree to tree. Yeah, probably yeah. not as readily, but not and not. birds as well. Birds as well. Little birds. More little birds as well. Uh, but little honey eaters aren't overly attracted to um, apple, pear, stone fruit. Mm -hmm. They, you know, our naturally occurring honey eaters are going to go to the berserias yeah. <laughs> and yeah. put their little their little beaks down. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. Uh, we would have struggled. Yeah. Kelly said um, we're looking for the word terminology called refuge. Mm. So it is a term, so it depends on who you are. Everybody has a different terminology, but a refuge for your beneficial insects is a f way to go on your farm using the plant species that we have native to the areas that um, your farm is. And there's a list of plant species out there you can um, utilise. 
to bring in the beneficial insects. I've got an Excel sheet that I've created with the expertise of Elizabeth, uh, Karen Thomas from Parks, uh, Port Phillip, Western Port v CMA, as well as a person in Tasmania that we've collated this big database and pulled it into one Excel sheet. So I'll send that around. It is a big document, but I'll send that around after this workshop, um, along with uh, a connection to series. So Elizabeth touched a little bit on series before. Series is an organisation that does a lot of research and in recent years have been doing a lot of research into beneficial insects in cropping systems and grazing systems. So, and Caesar. And Caesar. Sorry, that was just for that long story. <laughs> Caesar. So you can connect up to their newsletter um, via a link that I'll send you. I'll also send you the information about DRGDC. Mm. Um, and that'll be in a future email coming to you very shortly. Um, and also the there was another one, another one, wasn't there? Oh, identifying. I spy. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. I spy is another way of identify helping you identify insects. Um, the Victorian Museum also has a way of identifying insects as well. There's lots of apps out there at the moment to help you identify insects so, do, so you know it's a bad insect and what's a, a, a good insect as well. But go for three sources because sometimes Google lies <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. So we have a question from Robert. What are the common pests I might find in olives? Olives are very, very robust. The most major pest you're going to find in an olive is a brown scale. Um, that's the one that that's the one that really jumps to the front of my mind is brown scale is is uh, really prevalent on olives. Um, there's ways to combat that. Okay. Disclaimer is all advice is advisory in nature, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> going to do anything. Yeah, yeah. There's advisory in nature, you know, really concentrate, have a think about that before you want to go for it. So I am a really big fan of using um, oils in in um uh, IPDM control, it's, it's a fairly natural, non-invasive and um, a light way of intervening, but it's really quite effective and it's all about breaking that life cycle. So with that uh, summer oil or the winter oil, I'm not sure if you've ever used it before. Some people call it pest oil or neem oil, but we don't need to use neem. Um, but it's, what it does, it basically smothers the, the pore scale and it as asphyxiates, it suffocates. Um, but it's not, IPDM is not always just like, that's it, I just spray today and I don't have to worry about it, which is what conventional spraying is all about. I spray once and then it's gone. Um, to break, to make, make a beautiful break in the life cycle is to spray it, kill the adults, kill what's there right now, and then come up and do a clean up in two to three weeks' time for the, for the scale. But, um, yes, yeah, sorry, I don't have any more pests. To, that I can think that, you know, hares are a bit of a pain. Mm -hmm. They're a big pest. Uh, birds. Um, really, with the, with the olives, the most questions I have are about nutrition and how do I keep them on the tree without them, stop, you know, falling off. Or the next question is, um, oh, sorry, that I get asked is how do I make them all come off at the same time? So um, I hope I've answered your question, Robert. Have you got any other questions? Thank, oh, Robert says thanks, that's helpful, helpful. <laughs> very good. Any other questions from anybody? It is quite unusual sitting at this end of the screen looking at boxes um, of people's initials. I've never actually sat this end before. I've never done one of these before. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting. I do tend to ramble really quickly as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. If nobody else has got any questions, um, thank you for attending today. We're finishing up early, which is good. Um, I will be sending out an evaluation extremely shortly, like straight after. Uh, and oh, if you could take 10 minutes just to fill in the evaluation for us, it helps us to present, to be able to give you free workshops like this one. Uh, the workshop today was funded by the Commonwealth Funded Project National Land Care Project and um, through the From the Ground Up project. So thank you for attending and... Thank you very much for your comments there about Thank doing you. well and interesting and so forth. Please fill out the evaluation form and we shall see you in the near future for some of you. Goodbye. <laughs>